Watch this. In 1973, seven justices decided a woman's right to choose an abortion was between her and her health care provider. Today, six justices agreed that decision nearly 50 years ago was egregiously wrong and returned the right to an abortion to the individual states. In their opinion on Dobbs v. Jackson, the U.S. Supreme Court reversed the landmark case Roe v. Wade that provided those abortion protections, a ruling that will have an avalanche effect on women's reproductive rights and options. 13 states, including Idaho, have trigger laws in play, and they will now make abortions illegal at some point this summer, in almost every instance except rape, incest, or to save a mother's life. Joe Paris joins me now in studio. And Joe, you kind of spoke with Republicans. This is a part of the show where we got the reaction from both sides of the aisle. You spoke to Republicans and Democrats to get their reactions about this. Different than what you expected? No, I mean, this is actually exactly what we thought. Everyone I spoke to today, Brian, said that they were expecting the decision today. Really, since the Supreme Court decision was leaked back in May, they knew that this was going to be a result. But first, on the Idaho Republican side of things here, Majority Caucus Chair Republican Megan Blanksma, she drafted the 2020 law that Governor Little signed off on that will go into effect eventually this summer. And under that law, as Brian mentioned, in Idaho, Abortions will be effectively against the law. The only carve outs will be for cases of rape, incest, and medical emergencies. Now, Be Blanksma and other Idaho Republicans are celebrating the decision by the Supreme Court, but they know that the new law does come with side effects. For example, there will be women who give birth to children that they are not prepared to have, financially or otherwise. Blanksman says there needs to be an effort to take care of children and mothers with existing programs, as well as new or expanded efforts. What we need to do going forward is to focus on the trigger law and focus on providing additional support to women. And, and not only support to women, but we also need to address the other half of the equation of what about these fathers and figure out how to address that, try to keep families whole where we can, but make sure that the children that are born are supported by both parents and not just the mother. Critics are you know, concerned about what this will do to health and welfare, what this will do to Idaho adoption agencies. You know, there's worry that there will be like infant neglect. Um, to critics, to people that are concerned with this, I guess, what are your thoughts today? I know there's a lot to go into this, but what would, how would you respond to some of those criticisms? Well, I think that's where I go back to. We have programs in place for people to take advantage of. And I think that alarmists are ignoring that. They're ignoring the setup that we have existing for folks that, that might need these services. And I, I think that we need to make sure that over the next 30 days, we work really hard to get that word out so that support is pr provided for folks who need it. Idaho Democrats held an event at the state capitol today. They're speaking out on the decision by the Supreme Court, a decision they say brings the country back 50 years. Representative Alana Rubel spoke to the crowd of about 150 people this afternoon, and she and other speakers say they don't buy the argument for abortion that many Republicans cite. I am so tired of all the chest thumping about how they want to, quote, save the babies by banning abortion every way they can think of. The facts are very clear that banning abortion is a worse than useless way to actually reduce abortions. The abortion rates are highest in the world where abortion is banned, and they are lowest in the world in the places where abortion is perfectly legal. So if what you really want to do is reduce abortions, the last thing you should be doing is banning abortion, because the reason for this is that the very same people who want to ban abortions are are also the same people who are trying to block contraception, who are trying to block access to sex education, who are trying to obstruct everything that could possibly reduce unwanted pregnancies. These people who have done nothing but, practically speaking, increase abortions in the state, to me, have no business going around shouting about how they're saving babies simply because they want to force women through unwanted pregnancies. Real quickly, we wanted to clarify, there's been a lot of talk that the abortion law will go into effect 30 days from today. We got clarification. Yes. Today, the, uh, the Supreme Court of the United States put out an opinion. Well, we have to wait for the judgment. So 30 days from now, we'll get the judgment. 30 days from that, the Idaho law will go into effect. So this August, 60 days from today. Sometime in August. All right, thank you very much, Joe. Well, Idaho's trigger law has exemptions for rape or incest if the pregnant woman files a police report and gives a copy to the abortion provider. There's also an exemption for providers who are able to prove in court the abortion was necessary to save a mother's life. But how does a doctor determine that? So this is where we're going to bring in Morgan Romero. Morgan, you talked to a University of Idaho law professor, Shakira Sanders, about this exemption in the law. And we've heard this a lot today. Yeah. 
It's unclear. There's a lot of gray areas here. Yeah, I mean, even a legal expert who we view as the go-to expert right now said that this is really murky. You know, she said mm. there's going to be a lot of discrepancies between what different medical providers view as necessary, too. And you don't just have one doctor typically making decisions in situations like this. So, you know, it's reported as a crime if a provider does perform an abortion with this trigger law. And a prosecutor could then press charges then the provider would have to go to court. This exemption in Idaho's abortion ban outlines when a doctor would not be convicted of a felony for providing an abortion, the provider has to have a, quote, affirmative defense, that's a legal term, proven in court by a preponderance of evidence. So to break that down, what that really means is they have to prove it's more likely than not true that when using good faith medical judgment and based on the facts known to them, the abortion was necessary to prevent the death of a pregnant woman. Shakira Sanders, U of I College of Law professor, calls the language saying it's up to the doctor's good faith medical judgment very gray. The court hasn't really uh, done a lot of work by taking cases uh, to evaluate exactly what that standard means. Um, and it is unclear to me whether this is just a decision between the doctor uh, and the patient or if uh, uh, I don't believe Idaho has a book, uh, a law on the books that exactly details uh, uh, what type of medical conditions uh, that we are talking about and here uh, uh, in particular, uh, there is an overwhelming amount uh, of empirical work uh, that has demonstrated uh, the high disparities of medical issues when it comes to childbirth for women of color. You also see similar disparities with regards to the dangers of childbirth when it comes to poor women. It is not exactly clear to me when we're talking about health, safety, life, if we're talking about catastrophic uh, uh, incidents uh, or occurrences. Because Sanders, of course, is not a medical expert, she doesn't know how medical providers determine a pregnant woman's life is at risk and when abortion is really the best choice to keep her alive. But again, the term good faith medical judgment is a legal term. It's something a provider will have to prove in court. Sanders and other experts I talked to anticipate this trigger law could get held up in Idaho courts before it takes effect in August. As Joe said, we previously thought it was 30 days from now, but it's actually 30 days from that official judgment. Important to note, under Idaho's law, an abortion isn't seen as necessary when a doctor believes the pregnant woman might hurt herself. So Sanders says the law doesn't appear to apply to women with psychological illnesses who may be a danger to themselves. In another vein, there is talk over whether the decision to overturn Roe takes rights away or extends rights to the unborn. Interestingly, Sanders says it's really not that cut and dry. It's more about people's perception. For many of, of us, the right to terminate a pregnancy has been a part of our history and tradition. Uh, and that is the lodestar of the U.S. Supreme Court's analysis with regards to what is or is not a right. Um, and so I, too, am taking uh, some time to digest uh, I think uh, we have decades of legal analysis and scholarship uh, to come. I think this issue is way more complex for it to come down to an, a binary choice of taking one's right uh, and giving another person a right. Sanders says some states will beef up abortion accessibility, obviously Idaho and those 12 other states, not one of them with those mm -hmm. trigger laws. But really, she says this is going to come down to socioeconomic status, really more so than where someone lives. You know, if you think yep. about the ability somebody has to be able to drive to another state. And as we've covered a lot, media nationally and locally, a lot of activists and legal scholars believe this could be a slippery slope or potentially reverse decisions on rights that aren't enumerated in the Constitution like same-sex marriage. There's a lot of them, yep, mm -hmm. and we'll touch on that here in just a bit, but we're also going to touch on the medical expert that mm, good. Professor Sanders says she's not. Okay, good. Something we haven't heard of, from, I should say, in a while, or if at all. We have heard from the political side of this ruling and the legal expert side of it just now, but there's a part of this abortion equation that we haven't heard much from over the last few months. That's from the pr provider's perspective. That would be the doctor. The other one in the room when the decision to have an abortion is made. And they're the ones on the receiving end of Senate Bill 1385 that will go into effect in Idaho sometime in August. It says here, in 
me read this to you. Every person who performs or attempts to perform an abortion as defined in this chapter commits the crime of criminal abortion. Criminal abortion, unless they can prove it was to save the life of a mother. So we wanted to hear from one of those people, a doctor who could lose their license and spend years in prison for providing an abortion. Dr. Lauren Colson is a family physician that provides obstetrics and reproductive care. And that includes options counseling, of which abortion is one of those options. Dr. Colson is a member of the Idaho Academy of Family Physicians and sits on the Reproductive Health Committee. He's also one of the state leaders for Reproductive Health Access Project. So he knows a bit about this stuff. And Dr. Colson calls this ruling by SCOTUS a huge step backwards for reproductive health care. This option, he told us, is needed because, well, it's an integral part of how they provide health care to their patients. We know that without abortion access, that more mothers will die because they cannot get access to the care that they need. What we do know is that uh, pregnancy is a dangerous condition for a lot of people um, and that the United States uh, has a pretty high maternal mortality rate already uh, for a developed country and that this is only going to make it worse. So even though that the law says that um, there's a provision for the life of the mother to allow for abortion, more mothers will still die because they will not have access to abortion care. How do you weigh that with the rights of the unborn, which is the other side of this argument? My belief and the belief of our professional organization here, the Idaho Academy of Family Physicians, is that this is a very personal decision between the patient and the provider, and that is a decision that should stay in that area and not something that should be decided upon by anyone else, including our legislators. You're gonna be in this place where you're gonna have to make a decision. Like, you will not be liable for this if the physician determined it is good faith medical judgment that the abortion was necessary to prevent the death of the pregnant woman. Are there going to be situations where you're going to have to weigh your legal options over your medical options? Absolutely. It is not always clear at a appointment um, early on in the pregnancy, later on in the pregnancy, if the life of the mother is imminently in danger. There will definitely come a time when a patient is concerned based on their own health risks that they might have pregnancy complications and that they don't want to continue the pregnancy for that reason, but in that moment, it might be hard to justify that that is uh, to protect the life of the mother because it would be theoretical at that point. They wouldn't have had that complication already, and by the time they have that complication, it might be too late. Like where, what, what instances would that be the case? Probably the most prevalent one would be a condition called preeclampsia, uh, where a woman develops high blood pressure, and then uh, a lot of different organ failure problems, such as uh, swelling of the brain, seizures, um, and ultimately can lead to death. And that doesn't usually happen until later on in the pregnancy. Does it happen that people are given this risk assessment of preeclampsia, and they say, I don't want to deal with that, and they make the decision to have an abortion? Yeah, I would say that is one of many factors that the folks say, I, you know, I want to be pregnant, but I don't want to put myself or my family at risk. Um, these people aren't first-time parents. They have, they have kids, they have a family already. And I think while they may even be excited about the pregnancy, it may not be an unwanted pregnancy, when they weigh that against, is it worth it for me to leave my family to, to um, die by continuing this pregnancy? A lot of them will come to the decision of, no, it's not worth it to me. Um, I would not like to continue this pregnancy. There's a lot of gray area, they say, when it comes to what's that medical decision versus the life of the mother kind of thing. What's it like to be in that gray area? I think that that's what's hard for folks that don't have a medical background to understand is that that is the area we always deal in is gray area. And, and we're constantly weighing our decisions of, of these are the probabilities. What decision do you want to make as the patient um, as part of our shared decision-making process? Uh, it's almost never a clear-cut answer on most of medicine. Um, and so uh, that's why it's super important to us that we continue to keep this between the patient and the provider and for the patient to be able to make that choice that they feel that they need to make that choice based on the information that's been laid out in front of them. How's this going to change your life, your job, your career going forward? It, it's going to be really tough because I think Myself and my colleagues are gonna feel like we have to make a decision for patients to continue a pregnancy that they may not want and to follow them throughout that entire process. So, so for nine months, help them to manage themselves medically and carry a pregnancy that they don't want, that they expressed to us that they didn't want from the very beginning. Dr. Colson says doctors as a species are pretty risk averse. And instead of having to face that gray area of abortion, 
Most who now provide the option will likely just stop providing the option to avoid the chance of any legal trouble. He also told us right now a decision to have an abortion is 100% upon the patient. And when I asked if this ruling shifts some of that onus to the doctor to make that decision, worrying about the legal ramifications, Dr. Colson said, actually, that decision has already been made by Idaho lawmakers. Okay, so there's also the other side of this. Another side, the people's perspective. After all, according to a recent Gallup poll, 55% of Americans consider themselves pro-choice. But for Idahoans, that choice has been taken away. Andrew Bartline, well, he went out and talked to some of these people to kind of get their opinion, hitting the streets to kind of gauge what Boiseans are thinking about this right now. Yeah, and the people I spoke with today, they did fall on both sides of the aisle, aisle here. People who supported it, they like what the Supreme Court's doing. People who were very much against what the Supreme Court is doing. And when we talk to these people on either side of the aisle, Brian, um, you know, it was very passionate. People were very upset about what they were seeing. Now, we certainly heard more from people who were upset. The majority of people who did like the ruling weren't willing to speak with us on camera, but everybody seemed to be very much aware of how this impacts people. Now, moreover, with that, the people who consider themselves pro-choice, they said that they often don't talk about that with other people, or pro-life, rather. They often don't talk about that with other people because that's just an opinion they don't like um, getting attacked for. They generally oppose abortion and figured it's a good thing to further restrict abortion and abortion accessibility. But to the people who did speak with us, the majority of them, vast majority of them who were pro-choice, uh, were exclusively young women. Now take a listen to some of their opinions on the reality of Idaho's trigger law going forward. And of course it would ban most abortions here in the gem state. I just think it's awful that it's been overturned because it's just a bodily right to have um, the choice to abortion because no one should be able to make that choice for someone else. So I just think it's awful. It's, it's controlling women and people with the uterus. There's really no other reason. I understand people have different views and ideologies of and, and moral views on this subject, but it's, it's up to a singular person, not the whole. Especially living in a state like Idaho, it's really scary to just think that, especially when they can take away such a fundamental right as right to health care, that they'll continue to take away other things. And that's something that kind of generally surprised me out on the street today when I was talking with people, Brian, is, is how well informed people are about what's going on in the Supreme Court, what they're seeing. Now, the 14th Amendment is what has been protecting the federal right for abortion mm -hmm. for the last, was it been 49 years or so? So that also protects things like the right to same-sex marriage. Now, a lot of people on the street who are upset that, were, that really opposed what they're seeing in the Supreme Court right now, it wasn't only for abortion rights and what's happening today and the impacts right. of that, but other rights. What else is the 14th Amendment no longer going to protect? That's what people were mostly concerned about. And in case you didn't know this, the state of Idaho already has a gay marriage ban on the books waiting for SCOTUS to address this. And once they lift that, then that would go into effect here in Idaho as well. So there is genuine fear for that happening because as we heard Clarence Thomas, Justin Clarence Thomas talk about today, it's time maybe we start looking at these other things too, based on this ruling today. So, all right, thank you very much, Andrew.
Court decision. Today's Supreme Court decision came down right around 1030 this morning Eastern Time, right about the time that Joe Sider, the president of the Idaho chapter of National Association of Social Workers, was in the middle of a national conference in D.C. So hearing the decision, Joe decided to join several other attendees and jumping on the metro and head down to the Supreme Court building. Their goal was to see what was happening and represent reproductive rights, they said, because as a social worker, they believe rep reproductive rights are human rights and health care is a right for everyone. Well, this afternoon, Joe Siders joined us from the protest right in front of the Supreme Court and told us why they felt the need to be there. People are not happy with the Supreme Court. They're calling out specific justices. Is there anybody down there, like, on the other side of this? Um, yes, there was. There was a few people, and it, they got nasty fast, and more um, enforcement started to show up. Um, so, yes, there was a few. Yeah, the vast majority of people were, um, you know, are obviously here um, for body autonomy. Um, and to represent that they are not um, in agreement with what just happened today in any way, shape, or form. In about 30 days from now, Idaho is going to look a lot different. I mean, standing outside and chanting outside the Supreme Court, when you get home, you're going to have to face reality, I guess, right? This is the new reality. This is absolutely about health equity. Um, this is about social justice. This is about human rights. This ruling has so much more implications than just... Um, just Roe. Thomas made that clear in the, the other opinion release. This is about privacy. This is about body autonomy. Um, this is going to affect a whole lot of people. And it's important that although they're in Idaho, the 30 day calendar started right now, that is not, uh, <laughs> we need to assure safe access. You know, so I, I asked, I want to make clear that still for the next 30 days, abortion is legal and safe and accessible in the state of Idaho. Well, just as a clarification, that's for the next 60 days, because 30 days from now, we expect a judgment from the U.S. Supreme Court. 30 days after that, Idaho's trigger law goes into effect. You're looking at a live look now. Those people still out in front of the Supreme Court in D.C., hundreds of them standing outside protesting today's ruling.